So the first blood bank was established in 1930 in the UK. I will show you an example of a blood bag that has been collected from a donor. As you can see, the blood is very fluid. There is an anticoagulant or anti-clotting factor which is added prior to the blood collection. The best method of running a blood transfusion service is a voluntary one. This ensures that all donors are donors for compassionate reasons and are less likely to hide various information. For example, if the donor was paid for blood transfusion, he may use the money for drug abuse or other substance abuse, and this puts the patient at great risk. Therefore, the pre-donor care at the blood transfusion services is essential for a successful transfusion service. A donor has to be monitored and to be ensured that he is in good health. There are certain criteria some unique to a particular blood transfusion service, but generally the donor has to be in very good health. This is to protect the patient as well as the donor himself. The donor needs to be of a minimum age of around 17 or 18, depending on the center. He also has to weigh a minimum of 50 kilograms. His blood pressure and heart rate need to be normal and very importantly, his hemoglobin levels need to be around 13.5 grams per deciliter. In this way, we protect the donor. He or she may not donate for 56 days in between donations. In order to protect the patient, one has to ensure that the donors are asked many questions. These will include a personal health questionnaire as well as other information such as tattooing, body piercings and exposure to transmissible diseases such as malaria, syphilis and HIV. The questionnaire is really an integral part of the successful transfusion practice. After the questionnaire, the donor is sat in a blood donation chair where the blood is taken from the donor. The donation should last between four to seven minutes so that the labile factors are not destroyed before the blood is separated. So once the unit is taken after four to seven minutes, it is gently mixed and prepared. Less than 50 years ago, blood transfusions consisted of whole blood therapy only. Today, we know that component therapy is a much better way of treatment for patients. Once the blood is spun down, it is clearly separated into the top layer, or plasma layer, the middle layer, the buffy layer, and the bottom, red blood cell layer. In the buffy layer, one finds the white blood cells, which are responsible for protection of the body, as well as platelets that are responsible for coagulation or clotting. The plasma layer contains mostly albumin as well as other important protein components, including factor VIII. Factor VIII is an anti-hemophiliac factor which is important for hemophiliacs. The bottom layer, the red blood cells, are those cells which carry our oxygen throughout the body. There are different types of blood donations. The first one is an autologous donation. An autologous donation is when a person donates for himself. This could be for a number of reasons, such as religious reasons or patients that have got a very rare blood group type. The patient's blood is collected and stored for use at a later date. The second type of donation is directed donation, where a family member of a compatible group will direct a donation to one of his siblings or other family members. The third, although not frequently used, is a cadaver blood donation where blood from a deceased person is used for transfusion. The most common one and what most blood transfusion services rely on is the human to human normal blood collection process. There are two major hazards in blood transfusion. The first is incompatibility, and the second is transmission of disease. The latter is addressed by the questionnaire that is provided to the blood donor 
to ensure that he has not come into contact with any of the transmissible diseases. For the second hazard, the blood transfusion services will group the blood as the blood arrives to ensure that it is given to the correct patient. 